each part, you'll hear a number of different extracts. At the start of each extract, you'll hear this sound. You'll have time to read the questions before you hear each extract. And you'll hear each extract once only. Complete your answers as you listen. At the end of the test, you'll have two minutes to check your answers. Part A In this part of the test, you'll hear two different extracts. In each extract, a health professional is talking to a patient. For questions 1 to 24, complete the notes with information you hear. Now look at the notes for extract 1. Extract 1, questions 1 to 12. Mr. Smithers? That's right, Toby Smithers. Now, I think you've been having some stomach problems. Yes, that's right. Uh, for some time, actually. OK. I've got some notes here, but perhaps you can tell me in your own words about those problems. Uh, about any treatment you've been having or anything else you can remember that seems relevant. Mm -hmm, OK. It all started about nine months ago with a stomach upset. OK. Uh, you know, I, I thought I'd caught the vomiting bug that was going round. Yes. <laughs> uh, basically, I just couldn't keep anything down. Mm -hmm. uh, no diarrhoea or anything, but it was pretty bad. Right. Anyway, it cleared up in a couple of days, and I went back to eating normally. The thing was, though, from that time on, whenever I had a meal, lunch or dinner, I'd feel incredibly sleepy almost before I'd finished, and for about half an hour afterwards. Mm -hmm. I didn't feel tired as such, I mean, not in the sense of uh, fatigue. It's just that I could hardly keep my eyes open. I see. Were you in any pain? No, none at all. The only other symptom was that I was getting very thirsty, especially at night, so I was drinking a lot. Right. So I went to see the doctor, expecting some simple explanation, but she said my symptoms were quite unusual. Well, not the drinking. She explained that the stomach upset had left me dehydrated. Yes, that's right. But it didn't explain my other main symptom. And the dehydration passed. Yeah, that was just a temporary thing. Mm -hmm. Then she asked me if I'd ever had stomach cancer, which was a bit worrying. But you haven't. No, no. But then she explained that there's a condition that has similar symptoms to those I had. She didn't think I actually had that condition, because it generally affects people who've had stomach surgery, and I hadn't. It's called gastric dumping syndrome. Oh, yes. Anyway, what she suggested as, well, like an interim measure, was following the treatment plan for that syndrome, even though I probably hadn't got it. Mm -hmm. So I had to keep drinking, because I needed to keep my fluid levels up. Yes. Uh, but not whilst I was eating. So, in other words, I had to separate the two activities by about half an hour. Then, as for the meals themselves, she suggested an eating regime that she called little and often. So, you know, no major blowouts and no skipping meals either. Sure. It, did that help? Yeah, it did, but it was only meant to help me in the short term. Because, meanwhile, I had various tests. Uh, I gave a urine sample, uh, went for a blood test, neither of which showed up anything untoward. So I just hoped it'd clear up of its own accord. But it didn't. Well, no. 
The regime worked all right, but as soon as I went back to eating and drinking normally, the symptoms would come back. Okay. So the doctor referred me for an endoscopy. I saw a gastroenterologist for that. He'd looked at my other test results and examined me and everything. Sure. And of course, once the results of that came back, they showed that I'd got Helicobacter pylori. I see. So I went on the course of treatment.、Uh, you know, the three drugs for two weeks. Yes.、Yeah. Uh, two different antibiotics and an antacid. That's the combination which gets rid of it. Yes. After that, I went back for a breath test, and that was all clear. So I thought that'd be the end of it, and I'd be back to normal. But you're not. <laughs> Well, I've given it a couple of months, but the symptoms are the same. Okay. If I stick to the eating regime, I'm okay. When I come off it, I'm back to square one. So I'm thinking, sure, the stomach problem that the gastroenterologist found has been dealt with, but that wasn't what was causing the original problem. And how's this affecting your everyday life? Uh, I mean, I can live with it. Obviously, it would be different if I was driving for a living or operating machinery. But I'm a teacher, so it's okay. But to cut a long story short, I asked for a second opinion, and so here I am. Hello, doctor. Good morning. Good morning. What's your problem? Well, doctor, I have itchy red rash on my feet. Okay. What's your age? Twenty-one, doctor. Tell me if you have developed any associating symptoms or signs. It is tingling persistently, doctor. Since how long have you had this problem? For the past four weeks. Exactly on which part of your foot you are getting this problem? Right great toe, right second toe, right third toe, and right fourth toe. Often, the onset of itching starts after removing sweaty socks. Do you drink or smoke? I do not smoke, but I do drink. Have you had any diseases in the past? Well, I had chickenpox and frequent ear infections. You had any surgeries as well? I have surgical ear tubes. Do you take any medications? No, doctor. Are you allergic to any medicine or substances? Well, I get a severe rash when I access adhesive tape. Any of your family members have any history of illness? My paternal grandmother is having cataracts, and my maternal aunt has migraines. Well, your physical examination reports show blood pressure one ten over sixty four, respiratory rate is eighteen, heart rate is sixty six, and temperature is ninety eight point six. Lower extremities is warm to cool. Proximal to distal, the dorsalis pedis artery pulse palpable bilateral. 
Posterior tibial artery pulse palpable bilateral. No edema observed. Varicosities are not observed. Right great toe, right second toe, right third toe, and right fourth toenail show erythema and scaling. Muscle strength is 5 out of 5 for all groups tested. Muscle tone is normal. Inspection and palpation of bones, joints, and muscles is unremarkable. You have developed tinea pedis, a fungal culture of skin from right toes. KOH test shows no visible microbes. I am prescribing Lotrimin AF 1% cream to apply four times a day. Ingrisio Fulvin 250 mg PO once in eight hours for four weeks. That is the end for Part A. Now look at Part B. Part B. In this part of the test, you will hear six different extracts. In each extract, you'll hear people talking in a different healthcare environment. For questions 25 to 30, choose the best answer, A, B, or C, which fits best according to what you hear. You will have time to read each question before you listen to the audio. Complete the answers as you listen to the audio. Now look at the question 25. You hear a discussion between a nurse and a physician explaining about different types of breath sounds. Now read the question. Hello doctor, can you explain what are the different types of breath sounds? Well, there are several distinct types of abnormal breath sounds. Crackles, also called rails, tend to sound like discontinuous clicking. Bubbling or rattling when the person inhales. Uh, crackling breath sounds may sound dry or wet, and physicians might describe them as either coarse or fine. Stridor is a high-pitched, harsh, wheeze-like sound that occurs while breathing in people with a blocked upper airway. Wheezing noises are high-pitched and persistent that may sound like a breathy whistle. At times, wheezing can be loud enough to hear even without a stethoscope. A short version of a wheeze, called a squawk, occurs during inhalation. Ronchi are persistent, lower-pitched, rough sounds similar to snoring. Question 26. You hear a monologue by a physician explaining about Heberdeen's nodes. Now read the question. The bony growths that develop on the finger joints are called Heberdeen's nodes, or interphalangeal joints. Mostly, Heberdeen's nodes develop on the joints nearest to the fingertips, causing the fingers to appear crooked. They only develop in osteoarthritis patients. Each joint in our body has a layer of cartilage to protect the bones. Osteoarthritis causes the cartilage layer to degrade, gradually allowing the bones and the joints contact directly with each other. Over time, the bones get damaged from scraping together. Our body reacts to this body damage by developing new bones that are known as nodes. Heberdeen's nodes are one of such bone formations on the fingers of patients with severe osteoarthritis.
Question 27. You hear a discussion between a nurse and a physician explaining about surgical treatments for patients with a desiccated disc. Now read the question. Hello, doctor. What are the surgical treatments for patients with a desiccated disc? There are many different surgical treatments for a desiccated disc. In the method called fusion, the vertebrae surrounding the desiccated disc will be joined together to stabilize the back and prevent movement that will worsen pain causing discomfort. In the decompression method, the extra bone or a disc material that has moved out of place is removed to make more room for the spinal nerves. In the correction method, the surgeon will make the necessary repairs to correct an abnormal curvature of the spine to relieve pain and increase range of motion. In the implant method, artificial discs, or spacers, will be placed in between vertebrae to prevent the bones from rubbing. Question 28. You hear a discussion between a nurse and a physician explaining about outcomes of TB skin test. Now read the question. Doctor, can you explain to me the outcomes of a TB skin test? Well, the outcomes for TB skin tests are not always clear-cut. The main consideration in a TB test is the size of the bump on the arm. If the bump is smaller than 5 millimeters, then the test result is considered negative to TB. In a case where the test bump is larger than 5 millimeters, then the test result is considered positive. But we have to be very cautious about false positive and false negative. At times, Patients vaccinated against TB using the Bacillus calmet garin can show a false positive result for TB. There is also a possibility that when the patients infected with bacteria similar to TB, false negative result happens when a person has a weak immune system or has been exposed to pathogens such as smallpox or measles. Patients infected with TB very recently and very old TB patients can also show false negative test results. You hear a monologue by a physician explaining about atelectasis. Now read the question. A partial or complete collapse of one or both the lungs is called atelectasis. That occurs when tiny air sacs in the lungs called alveoli deflate. The collapse of the lowest lobes in both the lungs is called bibasilar atelectasis. The lobes of the lungs are filled with millions of tiny sacs called alveoli, which are arranged in clusters and surrounded by blood vessels. When a person breathes, the alveoli allow their blood to collect oxygen and exhale carbon dioxide. During bibasilar atelectasis, the alveoli in the lower lobes of the lungs deflate and stop performing this crucial task, therefore blocking oxygen from reaching the vital organs, life-threatening at times. Question 30. You hear a discussion between a nurse and a physician explaining about liver flukes. Now read the question. Doctor, what are liver flukes? Liver flukes is a parasite disease. A patient may never know he has liver flukes. Even the doctors at times may not diagnose the condition because the symptoms of fasciolysis are similar to many other conditions. There are chances that a person with liver flukes living may never develop fasciolysis. Others may develop fasciolysis many years after the liver flukes entered the body. A person cannot transmit liver flukes accidentally, 
to someone else unlike other parasite diseases. Liver flukes make their way from the intestines to the liver once it enters the body. To get into the liver, the liver flukes must burrow through the lining of the liver causing pain in the upper right abdomen. The two types of liver flukes that can affect people are fasciola hepatica and fasciola gigantica. That is the end of part B. Now look at part C. Part C. In this part of the test, you'll hear two different extracts. In each extract, you'll hear health professionals talking about aspects of their work. For questions 31 to 42, Choose the answer, A, B, or C, which fits best, according to what you hear. Complete your answers as you listen. Now look at Extract 1. Extract 1. Questions 31 to 36. You hear an interview with a scrub nurse called Joanna Swan. You now have 90 seconds to read questions 31 to 36. Today, I'm talking to Joanna Swan, who works as a scrub nurse in the operating theatre. Joanna, firstly, remind us what a scrub nurse is exactly and where the name comes from. Sure. Well, perioperative nurse is the correct term, of course. But basically, we're all familiar with the notion of scrubbing in. You know, you've seen surgeons doing it. It's not just washing your hands, it's doing that very thorough cleaning to ensure you're completely sterile before you go anywhere near the patient or the surgical instruments. Mm -hmm. But the name scrub nurse doesn't quite capture the full role. I mean, basically, your job's to prepare the operating room for surgery. You lay out the instruments, hand them to the surgeon when asked, and uh, you're also responsible for monitoring the patient. So you're like the bridge between the surgical team and everyone else who's supporting the patient. Mm. So how did you first get into this type of nursing? 
I remember one of my most formative experiences as a student nurse was shadowing a perioperative nurse in theatre. I had to scrub up to, and I was expected to lend a hand because they didn't want somebody just standing around in the way. <laughs> uh, it was all new to me, and I was worried how I'd react. I was fine around blood, but I'd never seen a wound being created before. It was a thirty-minute hernia op, so nothing special, but it left a deep impression on me. Then later. Uh, when I'd reached the stage in my career where I was up for a challenge, that image came back to me.、Mm. And what sort of background do you need to go into this kind of nursing? Well, you can do specialist courses, but I think what's crucial is having a fair amount of nursing experience, particularly in critical care settings. That was true of me, and there's really no substitute for that. To be honest, the job wouldn't suit everybody. The hours can be gruelling, and the work's very demanding.、Mm. You can't just pop out to the bathroom or have a snack when you feel like it, and、um, you're stuck in a small room with some quite strong personalities who are also under pressure. So it's a very intense environment, but also a very rewarding one.、Mm. And what skills does it call for? Well, basically, every second counts. You've got to be very efficient and able to think ahead and get things organised. You know、um, what needs doing immediately, what can wait a few moments, what you need to do now because you might not get the chance later, and so on.、Mm. I mean, that's the kind of thing you can train somebody for up to a point. But to do it well, you've got to be in the mindset to start with. Attention to detail is crucial.、Um, if that's not how you are, then you're not going to be right for the job. You have to be there mentally, one hundred percent, as well as physically. And I guess the idea of the team is really important in theatre.、Mm, indeed, it's got to be part of the system. I mean, especially when you're on call, you never know who you're going to be working with. For an operating theatre to run smoothly, there's got to be clear communication and coordination between everyone concerned. Because it's the collaboration within the team that keeps patients alive.、Mm. In my hospital, to promote team spirit, we set great store by meetings,、uh, the preoperative briefing, of course, but also meetings to discuss issues and generate new ideas. As a nurse, it's great to feel that your voice counts, and that's not always the case in medicine. So for me, that's a big plus. We also take opportunities to debrief staff after difficult events. I mean, that's crucial too.、Mm. And what about the interactions with the patients? Well, some people have the idea that in the operating theatre you're going to be having just mechanistic interventions on patients who are in no position to respond or interact with the nurse. That you're just providing support to the surgeon and the anaesthetist. But these days, theatre nurses are required to have a holistic, patient-centred approach to care, and this extends beyond the period of the patient's actual surgical experience. Preoperative visitings become the norm, so that patients see a familiar face when they come in for treatment, and this can really reduce stress levels on the day for the patient. For me, this is a really positive development, and I'm always keen to take on that role. Now look at extract two. Extract two, questions thirty-seven to forty-two. You hear a junior doctor called Graham Holder 
giving a presentation on the subject of hand transplants. You now have 90 seconds to read questions 37 to 42. Good morning, my name's Graham Holder. I'm a junior doctor here at the hospital. The subject of my presentation today is hand transplants. I'm not a specialist in this area and I have no direct experience of it, but I've always found it fascinating and I'd like to share my interest in it with you. So, first of all, what is a hand transplant and why is it better than prostheses? Well, it's a type of a CTA, that's a composite tissue allotransplantation, in which skin, fat, muscle and nerve bone are all transferred from one person to another. To date, it's largely been used to treat patients with both functional and aesthetic deficits that can't be dealt with by conventional methods, but this is changing. The mainstay of treatment for amputated limbs has long been prostheses, but patients often reject them because they only provide limited mobility and function, and they can be uncomfortable. In theory, at least, transplanting a complete part should give much better results than even the most advanced prosthetic technology. So, more and more upper limb transplants are being performed around the world every year, and this is largely thanks to new and more powerful immune suppressive drugs. The strategies in use have been derived from the experience of transplanting organs, especially kidneys, and this has also informed the choice of drugs. Slightly higher amounts of immune suppression are used with a potent induction followed by a low dose maintenance regime. This regime can be supplemented by short courses of intensive therapy to overcome any episode of acute rejection. The survival rate of both patients and grafts under this regimen outperforms that for all other transplants. That's actually pretty impressive. At least one episode of rejection is recorded in 90% of cases, however, despite the immune suppressive protocol, and this is much higher than with kidney transplants. One reason for this is that hand transplantation represents a visible graft. That means you can make an immediate diagnosis of rejection based on minor changes in skin appearance, even though this has to be confirmed by a biopsy. If patients adhere to the regime, however, rejection is generally reversible. One of the challenges of hand transplantation is to achieve the delicate balance that prevents rejection whilst at the same time protecting patients from the direct toxicity of the medicaments. But this seems to be working, and infection is actually the commonest complication. So, what happens during a hand transplant operation? It's a six-hour procedure, which involves two separate surgical teams, one removing the hand from the donor, and the other working with the recipient. Bones are joined with titanium plates and screws. As with other bone grafts, 
They should eventually heal together, but the plates are left in to ensure stability. Surgeons then connect key muscles and tendons before tiny blood vessels are connected using surgical microscopes. Three major nerves are then attached, followed by large and small veins. Once blood is circulating, the recipient begins to feel the new hand. A recent case attracted a lot of interest in the UK. It was a bilateral transplant for a man who'd lost both hands in an accident at work. Now, bilateral transplants aren't so uncommon, but what made the case particularly noteworthy was the fact that he still had both his thumbs, but not the rest of his hands. So it wasn't a transplant performed at the wrist, as is usually the case, but in the substance of both hands. Nonetheless, immediately afterwards, he managed to gain some movement in his donor hands and has since improved dramatically. Indeed, just nine months after the procedure, he was able to write a thank you letter to the surgeon. His recovery experience mirrors that of most transplant patients. The incredible thing about him is the speed at which he's gained that functionality. So, what about donors? One of the challenges of hand transplantation is that the hands not only have to fit immunologically, they also have to look right because they're going to be on view, an issue that doesn't arise with internal organs. That makes the job of finding an appropriate donor even harder. In any case, because hand transplantation is rather unusual, people have been slow to donate, and there have been occasions when surgeons had to ask for a donation when somebody's offered other organs, but not specifically the hands, and that's a really difficult thing to negotiate with next of kin at the time of death. The hand transplant program is now established, and it's becoming mature. It'd be nice to think that hand transplants could become as routine as kidney transplants. Setting up a donor network is the next goal. That is the end of part C.